Outlaw Signals present a Bon Mott's Halloween series celebrating six decades of horror. To perform an autopsy first. With in depth analysis. That's no too vulgar display of power. Adult content. I didn't hurt him, okay? Adult language. You gotta come work for me. And spoilers. Mrs. French's cat is missing. Join us. All you can do is pass it along to someone else. And there's a finale to Mott's Queen. Ah! This Saturday, we will be doing a live review. Ah! Halloween, the movie at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on our YouTube channel. So please come and join us. Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to Bon Mott's Radio for our Halloween special. So for this episode in the 2000s, we decided to do a foreign film because back in the day, back in the 2000s, Americans were stealing so many ideas from Japan, like Ring and uh, The Grudge. So we decided to give a little shout out to our all the foreigners out there who are creating great horror classics. So we made up a list of six movies and we ended up with, well, not quite a foreign film, but not Canadian. A, not American. <laughs> yes. So foreign enough. America light. With Pontypool. I'm your host, Jonathan Ian Manser, here with our producer, Scott Thurlow. I'm Wolfman Scott, baby. And our Back from Afghanistan, intern, Stephen Hermosi. Welcome to the podcast. None of those are actually correct, but we're referencing Ponty Pool. So, who would like to give a description of this movie? I will. The logline for this movie, I think we just had on, and clearly probably might have been in actuality, I'm in the apocalypse. <laughs> it's absolutely like... It, it, it Rush Limbaugh, like kind of, but I miss is much more like even stylistic. Yes, it's, it's we'll get into that. There. That's why I said that, but sure. Um, anyway, so Scott, continue with the introduction. All right. Well, I think I count the the title like appearing on screen as part of the introduction, mm-hmm. given uh, what uh, comes in the plot. So words start appearing that are spelling out Pontypool, but the first word it spells out was is typo, and then all the other letters get filled in, and that was a very nice little fade in, and then it cuts to begins with a perhaps uh washed up or what's implied to be soon enough guy in a cowboy hat driving along a in a horrible uh night blizzard or early morning blizzard it's implied to be like four or five in the morning maybe yes and he's he's uh, arguing with his agent has a little uh tiff with him and then as he's uh pulling into the before he pulls into the radio station at work he gets oddly accosted a attractive woman shows up knocks on his car mouths something at him he can't hear it then she sort of walks backwards into the darkness and disappears and he goes that was odd and continues on to work and uh, it's revealed that he's a host of a small town small time radio station public sort of radio and then he shows him to work and does his normal routine pours himself a nice cup of coffee mixed with booze of course and starts doing the news and then an event happens in town that causes uh, them to be on to question what's actually happening the true beginning of this movie is kind of a blue radio signal radio mm. waves oh yes true. and you're right. You find I, out later that it's him speaking. Uh, it's not quite clear right. initially. I, I never should mention that, but here. And it's this weird kind of philosophical musing about the naming convention of the town, like going back to like the French and how it kind of evolved throughout time. And very like I, I was David Lynchian. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's an app kind of throughout this movie that you can com- uh, easily compare the stylistic. Uh, but it's a great kind of David Lynch opening, which is unsettling right mm. off the bat. If any of our uh, listeners here listen to any other podcasts, it, it was actually really similar to the way that Welcome to Night yes. Vale works. But that's just the entire podcast, where this is just an introduction about, like you said, kind of just him musing about like uh, the ways that names work and things like that. But it starts off with, uh, I believe, Honey the Cat is missing. Yes. yes. And he's talking about Honey the Cat and just starts repeating... Uh, the name of the town, which is Pontypool, and all that stuff kind of comes into the story later on. 
So it was a really good cold open. You guys are both absolutely right. Um, I think it's an important part of it because uh, it, it sort of sets up sort of the, some of the themes and uh, points they're going to have in the plot. And I agree with also Steve-O. I got a little a Night Vale feeling from it for sure. Just It's a, it's a sort of a stream of conscious, like dreamlike rant about the name of the town, as you said, and various definitions and where the um, origins of the phrases and so forth that make it up. The etymology of it. I don't know if this is tr- uh, going to the body or not, but it establishes right off the bat that this the main character who uh, Grant Grant Mazzie, Mazzie, Grant Mazzie yeah. is either has been a much more successful uh, yes. host at one point. I think it's pretty clearly now implied. Dropped down to kind of a local station, or he's a local host who wishes uh, who thinks he deserves to be much better. Well, it kind of seems like he's new at this station because. Mm-hmm. It seems like they're still developing, like he's still developing a relationship with his producer, and yeah, I got that feel from him. Um, mm-hmm. So it seems like he had a better job, it's lost implied. it in some way, and then has come to this other this new radio station. To, I think it's somewhat like there. what I got out of it was he worked at a bigger, like a much bigger city, perhaps like in Canada, and now something happened, or whatever may have happened. Maybe I missed it up because he certainly resembles I in many ways, and we'll yes. talk about that. But yeah, he's he's now small time in a small town, and like not much has happening there, so he feels sort of stifled by yeah. it all. And not only stifled, but he needs he has a, like a, a need to build upon the stories and make commentary yes. where there is none to be a colorful host. Yes, yeah. I mean, he's entirely different philosophy than the producer uh, uh, <clears throat> Sydney. Sydney, yeah, who wants to do a straight news, uh, mm. and this is what they expect of us. And he's saying no, like we need to build controversy yes, exactly. in order to get viewers. Right. So, like that provides a nice initial conflict that carries throughout, the, I guess, the first half of the film. It's actually a v- kind of like if anyone watched the newsroom, that kind of inside look into what it's like mm. to like, again, newsroom is doing national broadcast. This is doing a local TV station, but it kind of gives it like a nice little like Window. kind of self-contained sure. storyline. Mm. It's a of, microcosm into that definitely uh, of, of this world, and I. I I was enthralled by that more than any of the horror elements that came later. <laughs> no, it was all very well done, I agree. And I, I'm going to wrap up my thoughts on the introduction. I think all that is part of the introduction. And like I said, I, I felt the movie kicked off with when they started getting reports of like the odd, be- you know, the violence that's happening. Uh, and they start getting like eyewitness and calling people calling in and it starts going a little bizarre. But all, everything up to that, I think, counts as the introduction. It was all very well done. Mm-hmm. When they start talking to Ken, yes. the weatherman. I feel that when Ken gets cut off, for the first time, that's really the end of the introduction. I'll, I'll pretty much agree with that, yeah. To build off, I mean, this is kind of going to themes, but that idea of like the radio station, they have an eye-in-the-sky chopper, uh, yeah, but it turns out that he's just in his car. It's a guy has, in a Dodge uh, making uh, plain sounds. Yeah, yeah. He, has, uh, he has the sound of the propellers, so it, <laughs> it gives the illusion. But the entire thing is, all of this is just illusion, and that really builds into themes later on, but well-established right off the bat sure. of the surreal nature of the world. Exactly. Especially... You have an early morning, again, before 4 a.m., He's like, you're seeing the clock tick throughout this. Isolation mm, of an sure. early morning news show in, in kind of nowhere Canada being faced with something they're not certain of. So as we're talking about that, then I guess we'll go into the body. Or well, we'll I'm giving, give our scores first. I'm giving it a one to the intro yeah. for sure. It's all right, excellent absolutely. setup. Same. So uh, as I was just saying, with going into the body, uh, Stephen, would you like to continue from where Scott left off? Uh, sure. You gave the intro one as well, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So the body kicks off, as Scott was saying. <clears throat> There's a point where they go to the quote-unquote eye in the sky who's uh, sitting in a car on a hill overlooking the city. The biggest hill in the smallest town. Uh, yeah, exactly. And he gets cut off. Nobody really knows what's happening. And they're, as they're going through, they're starting to get reports of like this huge riot at a doctor's office. Nobody really knows what's going on. Eventually, they get back in touch with Ken, the weatherman, and he is like run away from his car at this point he's being chased and you mean his chopper right his chopper <laughs> well, at one point when he's on air he says something like the roads are the all roads blocked are like, like i can't go anywhere i noticed that i was in the <laughs> line like he can't kick up the illusion anymore he doesn't care anymore <laughs> but uh you know he goes off and, and goes and hides and he gives like kind of throughout the first half of the movie the only thing that we know are reports that we get from outside uh the entire inside of the station is completely isolated other than that he is he is like their person that they know like giving reports back to them and he's in like a silo or something he finds like a big silo not a, the small a, one a kid from town that he recognizes and uh the the kid is speaking in strange voice like like a child's voice is trying to escape from him or something like that and it keeps going on and just kind of the tension gets ratcheted up like crazy in the first half mm. of this movie and it's all done from inside this like isolated little box that they're in eventually the apocalypse comes to you as it always does and these 
we're probably going to describe them as zombies, but they're not really zombies. They're, they're the like, infected style, of course, yeah, more or less. They're like meme zombies, basically. But <laughs> sure. like as that. it turns out, there's a illness that is uh, propagated through words, and specifically English words, and only certain ones. Throughout the entire movie, they're trying to figure out what's happening, and they're still, like, they're continuing to be on air for the most part until the infected actually break into the, the radio station. And um, it kind of builds from there they uh, i get i'm trying to i'm trying to figure out where the like climax actually begins what do you guys think i would say when they leave the sound booth and with the doctor no the climax begins when they're or, the, or they oh, change no, the, the door back room yeah and then they decide to All leave right. that I, I guess when the intercom or the, the generator goes out and the intercom starts playing oh canada yeah okay yeah. All right, fair uh, enough. that's really the start of the conclusion all right i'll give it that. Uh, it's actually quite a small conclusion but before we go into that there is so much in this movie that yeah, like Steve-O did his best into delving into one avenue of this complex like storyline. Really, it's about what how little we know. And we have a news organization here who should be the forefront of... Like, they have reporters, they have... Like, and they do a great thing where they have the BBC come in because this is their only news outlet who has access to the apocalypse. Mm. And even they don't know what's going on. Yeah. <clears throat> um, not the BBC, but like the uh, the local radio station. So you're stuck in this world with just like hints of what's going. On. It was pretty apparent right off the bat that it was kind of a zombie type thing happening. Right. But they didn't know that, and it's kind of weird that it takes place in sort of modern day, and no one was like, eh, "It sounds a lot like zombies." Mm. But uh, regardless of that point, there's this great moment I think is the ha- uh, exactly the halfway point in the movie where. They're all trying to come to grips with all this information coming in, and uh, uh, Mazzy, the the host, starts doubting whether all of this is real. And the the direction of this movie and the script of this movie is perfect because you start doubting because you're not seeing any of this either. In most apocalyptic works, you have kind of the omnipresent narrator; yes. you know what's going right. on. Mm-hmm. Here, you're you know as little as the main characters do. Right, and so you know. Is this like a prank? Is this like uh, someone like pulling a uh, War of the Worlds on um, Mazzy? Um, <laughs> Reverse so, War of the Worlds. Uh, like, uh, for instance, there's an intern in there who was an Afghan like veteran, and she starts falling into her kind of military habits. They're calling people sir just sir, randomly. Yeah. And again, that adds an element of, is she in on this? Mm. Like, you, you have not yet seen a zombie. You're just hearing people calling in. So yeah. it... it adds that level of paranoia and you really feel it when Mazzy starts breaking down. I agree with all that. Yeah, and I think because of the setup it's it's really effective because you're in a radio station so it's almost like you're getting um audio logs in a game like you're just you don't you're only hearing reports. You don't see what's happening. Mm-hmm. So that's all they have to go on. That's all the characters have to go on. That's all you as the audience has to go on. And because it it works so well because of course at a radio station that's what would be happening. It's a perfect setting. This is what Steve said that feeds into the perfect ramping up of tension as the movie goes on and they find out a little bit more but they're still confused by it and then he, yeah, he questions everything that's been happening already up to that point I will make this comment though as much as I love this movie and I absolutely <clears throat> adore it to take the body as an act the first half of the second act is phenomenal but the minute that paranoia fades it kind of ha- starts falling into horror tropes. Yeah, there. a little, but I think they like, use them well still. I'm going to yeah. say that. But. So I wasn't as enthralled with the second half of the second act. And spe- like at one point, the doctor, we, uh, Steve, I mentioned earlier that a doctor's office was being attacked. Mm. It was specifically a doctor's office of like what, Menendez or yeah. something like that. And he ends up showing he up at the radio up station, the, He breaks into the Which, thing. again, <laughs> is a... Crawls in through the yeah. vent. It, 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 it's kind of a horror movie trope there. I think they needed that to have someone to give that level of scope. Well, he was the exposition. He, he was yeah. like the scientist explaining what's happening with everybody, yes. what's going wrong. But I almost kind of wish they didn't do that. Because it felt very forced. Mm. It, and it almost felt unnecessary because I was more interested in not knowing what was going on mm. as... But like having someone conveniently come in and be like, I'm deducing that this is happening. Yeah. And I see what you mean, but I don't think it was as egregious as maybe you got out of it. But yeah, no. so they fo- they fell into some conventions, yeah. but I think they even so they used them well. No, by, by no means was it poorly done. It was just the first half of this movie I see raised such a high bar. Yeah, sure. And I even like we took a uh, short break. I even said that I don't think the second half can stand up to how good the first half was. 
And it, it, it was sufficient for me not to rate this poorly, but I, I still must say that... Uh, it, it, it tapered off the page. You can, yeah. start, you can really start nitpicking the second half. Mm. Just to talk about the Doctor for a minute, I, I kind of figured that it was going to have something to do with him, but it seemed like he was just as clueless as everybody else. He was just kind of figuring it out as he went. Right, so I guess it kind of subverted my expectations in that mm-hmm. way. When he showed up, I was like, "Oh man!" He, like, and and everything was centered around his, his doctor's office. Time. I was like, "Yeah, he, this is gonna yeah. it's gonna be like his fault in some way or something." But I think it still might have been because they didn't they flesh it out as yeah, well. But, but, but that was fine. Yeah, questions on that was which a I well done like, choice. Right. I think. But we're going into characters a little bit. But at a certain point, like he starts speaking in German, which kind or of and, and there's German. also like, kind of, like they mentioned like. Um, some of the like, they're not traditional zombies in the sense that they're mindless. They're speaking things and they attach themselves to like, like, re- kind of like repeating honey, phrases. The, uh, honey the cat. So they're all ca- carrying um, pictures of Honey the cat. Or it's, it's described <laughs> or yeah, they get entranced upon one word. And at one point, someone mentions that they're all talking about U boats. So yeah. I feel that there could be like they leave hints of what could be the cause but yeah, never maybe. go into sure. the I think that, uh, that's true right. and I, but I think that was a smart choice on their part Absolutely. you got anything more to say about the body no I think are you going to get covers it? it I'm going to give it a one I'm going to give it a soft one on that the second half of the body wasn't as strong but it was strong overall Fair so enough. yeah I'm going to pretty much agree it was perfectly fine and I'm giving it a one now the conclusion if you've ever seen return of the living dead it's basically the <laughs> same ending, which I love the ending to Return of the Dead. <laughs> so what happens, he ends up finding out that you can... We mentioned earlier that the infected harp on one word. What happens or a is, phrase, a, yeah, a repeating yeah. motif of a phrase. We'll uh, from what I understand, this virus, which is a kind of psychological virus, I suppose, it starts attaching itself to words in the English language. Hmm. And almost drives the person insane as it was. Well, would they become a mindless zombie? Yeah, they become a mindless zombie. So the main character figures out that if you change the meaning of words, if you kind of like... Or obfuscate the meaning. Yeah, break a person by... Uh, like So he's... Uh, Sydney, his producer, is infected with kill. Like she just can't kill, kill. And he starts trying to find ways to break her out of it. I think it's actually... It could have been handled very poorly, yeah, but it worked done. completely well for this. And even added a like, kind of a romance angle that worked, I suppose. It wasn't to, quite there before, but it was fine that it yeah. happened at that point. In the plot, uh, yeah. He ends up finding that kiss is uh, the word, like, make, like taking the word kill and inserting the meaning of the word kiss, I guess because they're so close together uh, linguistically, it confused, I guess, the virus or... It was an antidote almost, yeah, pretty much. Or yeah. inoculation to it or sure. something. Yeah. And... It ends up with kind of a funny part where she's like, kill me, (laughs) and uh, they end up kissing. So this leads to them deciding to go onto the radio and broadcast to the world that they found the cure. And I like this because it it's a heroic moment and he gives like this gallant speech about why they need to even though it's gonna like the zombies are attracted to voices, so even though they're gonna be broadcasting, it's gonna put them in danger, he needs to do this. But in a way, since he's has his idiosyncrasies as a host he's not clear enough on the radio to really get his message across. <laughs> he's kind of rambling. And it, it, it causes the military to think that he's infected on the radio and thus putting others in danger. So as he's... It, he gets his one final, like, basically, fuck you to, right. the, um, to the government, and that and you hear the countdown and the bomb hits the radio station. And so, that's the final scene, yeah. yeah it's it perfect. cuts black to right All goes there. black. Yeah. So, although I had seen it before, I think it was done effectively, and it... Drew me back in, and I'm a sucker for a uh, Henry V kind of yes. speech at the end. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'm going to be biased. I always like to see that kind of ending, sort of a thing ending, or you know, like any anything where on a small scale they've won a victory, but of course, like they're getting nuked or whatever, like they're destroyed, they're getting destroyed by outside forces. Yeah. So I, I, I'm always I'm always going to be partial to that. But I think I agree, it was well pulled off here. Again, it, it was a perfect uh, coda to the film. I really like the ending of this, and honestly, I think that it was not entirely clear what the motivations of the government were mm. i'm still unconvinced that it was entirely clear because they did they said that they thought he was sick however we're th- we're going from the opinion that he was entirely not sick which he could have been exhibiting some symptoms that weren't found in mm. other people or something like that but like but they made <clears> it clear early on that at least he's infected 
because he right. has well, that's those what, moments. That's what I was going to say. He has a couple moments where it's like it seems like he's becoming infected and like he just kind of flips out and I and you and you don't really know what was going on there or what was happening. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, I I kind of like that they brought all that back in in the conclusion and kind of left it up to you to decide how you wanted to to see it because, you know, they get killed assumedly they get killed at the very end anyway. But I think that he makes it clear in his final speech on the radio what the motivations of the government are. It's really not a motivation that the ultimate response is that militaries kill scared people. Mm. Right, but that's and in his mind. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we're seeing this all from his point of view, which is not to say that he's necessarily wrong, but it's mm. to say that there mm. are also other ways of yeah. you know coming at it. But yeah, I, I think they did a great job of that. And the whole finding a cure and it seemingly not really being worth much anyway mm. <laughs> at the end is, you know I, I dig that a lot you know a lot of a lot of times stuff like that is just kind of pointless in real life Fair as enough. well as in the movies yeah, we should not cure any diseases and just murder all the people who... <laughs> thank you Steven so I'm going to give it a one I as well yeah I'm going to give it a one as well alright Scott good luck alright well themes. themes is to me so this is an interesting one I think we can spend probably an hour just on this because as Ian mentioned earlier it contains so much in a, in a you know, it's, it wasn't an hour and a half and change movie. Yeah. They do, they do a lot of things into the blender and they all work pretty well, but there's so many of them. But I'll, I'll just explore my favorite one because it sort of spoke to me as a uh, wannabe writer when we used, when I used to be um, writing stories. I like to explore the meaning behind language and like, you know, how it can change and mutate and so forth. And language itself sort of, maybe this is jumping the gun for a different question, but the antagonist is language being perverted, I guess, or being, you know, usurped by some kind of they, they imply it was like the doctor says something like a perception and then it becomes a reality it was something odd like that um it's sort of the idea of the newest fear if you guys have ever heard of that concepts and images in our mind can somehow be made real like you know even if they're abstract so right. it, like that sort of like that sort of got to me that in this film that's i sort of got that angle from it but either way i like the way they explored that how like yeah certain phrases and certain words would trigger it but not always and there were certain like clumps of them that, early on they got a weird translation that said uh, avoid using terms like you know of endearment like honey sweetheart baby blah 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 and also please don't translate this message and of course he was just reading out the translation of it like that was a little clever touch i think and specifically just english that yes the, 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 i'm sure that the screenwriter had taken a philosophy of language class mm. once upon a time because... i figured you might get into that too because yeah. i know like ian himself isn't as big into this uh, topic but i think yeah you know, they touch upon that very well of course but they also did like in, in his rant, he had a couple of uh, anti-military rants, you know. But uh, but of course, then he worked with an or with an Afghan veteran, and she was characterized very well until she got infected herself, and you know, it was sort of tragic at that point. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of this uh, film coming out when it did, what, what was this 2008? Eight, I believe. Yeah, sorry. coming out when it did was had it owed to the like large explosion of internet memes and things that were Maybe. coming out around the same time. But not only that, because there's such a military thing, they have the Afghan veteran there. Around this time was the rise of the battle of narrative amongst politicians, of subverting the uh, the spoken word in order to be more persuasive. So a lot of their, like Iraq, uh, there's a lot of like kind of subversion of language to mm-hmm. get us into that war. And we have a negative opinion in America of it, or largely. And in Canada, I know it was even more popular. So like... I think that the the military undercurrent here fits very well into the evolution and almost maladaptive fixture of language. Mm, yes. Well, I mean, so. there's always been propaganda and things like that, and it's. I, I mean, I I feel like there's always the propaganda pieces, and then there's the anti-propaganda pieces that come afterwards. And yeah, I think that there that this definitely did have that undercurrent. But disregarding that for a minute, this movie didn't seem necessarily anti militaristic to a large extent I, well, the military in the, the military was kind of a neutral party in this but if i may make a expand off that actually even today we're, we're filming this in september for halloween but uh um, bill maher jorge ramos was on there recently and he was challenging chris matthews to the fact that the press did nothing to really challenge the government's view on the uh iraq war so I think this is less about like, necessarily the military's failure in language or um, uh, abuse of language, but more of the presses. We need to get this information out there. But the doctor, uh, Dr. Mineta, says that, are you sure you're not 
risking people's for the sake of getting the information out there. Mm-hmm. It's really a challenge, I feel, to the idea of the press. Right, but in which way? Like, it, w- would it have been better or worse for them to actually go on air at that point? Well, I think that they do a good job of really giving both sides. Yeah, leaving yeah, it open. Making the case for both yeah. points, yeah. I agree with that. You know, it, yeah, it's uh, the idea of like sort of the perversion of language to be used as a weapon or like it, or just evolving itself. We become slaves to the whatever message is being presented and, you know, getting caught up in that and therefore we I lose but, all meaning, really. Actually, I actually think one great moment, and this is perhaps one of my favorite moments in this film, so when he's reading off the obituaries. And it's a very absurdist piece because he's reading off very real and dark obituaries of people. Oh, this person survived long enough to kill his, like, four other members. Yeah, it's implied, like, member. like, all the victims that just, yeah. like, had to eat each other, really. Yeah, but Succumb to the virus. Yeah, but it's also juxtaposed against our very sanitized concept of obituaries in today's thing. Yeah. So they do a lot of, like, there's a lot of theory in here um in the netflix uh, description it says metaphysics i disagree that it's i mm. think they're just using that term like it's really not i think it's more of philosophy of how we use language I agree with that, and for sure. how the press uses language and again they're doing you have a local news station with a shock jock in a <laughs> sense running it faced with real organization uh with real news and uh, like and you have the bbc which is wide one of the most widely respected news organizations mm. and they talk about their failure to have information as well. So hitting at all angles like these yeah, sure. great, great ideas. But I think it also speaks to, um, you guys are both kind of t- talking to the idea of language as a weapon, but for the most part, like the way the way that language is used had nothing to do with where this went. It, it was like once it was unleashed, it was entirely uncontrollable and just indiscriminate yeah, in the yeah, way sure. that it went. So it's perhaps more of the idea of even if you want to use language as a weapon, you're not going to be able to control it. Like ideas, once they get out there, are yeah, of course they, uh, they, you they take on their yeah, own. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, and they, they take on their own, become their own virus. And like that's the idea of like beams, like it's or like you know, it, and a song that becomes sure. an earworm just I gets in your that. head. You, it's hard to tell what is going to take on, become that. But also, once it happens, it's nigh impossible to stop it. Yes. Uh, that's that's all true, and I agree with it. Of course, like it, I, what I was saying was one of the levels of it, but I think I, maybe the the most broadest of themes that they, all of this addresses is connection and meaning via language, whether it be the press, whether it be between us as personal, whether it be trying to just report the news or obituaries in a sanitary way, but well, horrifying the, events are happening. The most dangerous language for the virus that spread is baby talk and yeah. the terms of endearment, which are, in a sense, nonsense words. Yes, and they also and, say they say avoid rhetorics or rhetorical phrases rhetorical. or something like that as well. And that the, I, the how to beat the virus is to lose understanding of how we is it evolve from the language we're using to yes. a greater understanding while avoiding the, the old negative. negative. It's almost like it's like right. 1984. They need to invent new speak on the spot <laughs> because it's the cure for the virus, but which is very interesting for sure. By the way, get the screenwriter on the horn, Steve-O, because I would love to have mm. an interview. Oh, with yeah, let's, uh, let's get We're him on the horn and see right what now. he can do. Yeah, yeah. We'll, But uh, no, we'll for sure, I, I agree with, with all that, and I think it's, it was explored very well and touched upon throughout the movie in various ways. So that's just one theme yeah, here. <laughs> so I would like to talk a little bit about Exploring, since it's a Halloween episode, the use of the zombies in this movie. And what I find fascinating is that I don't think at once you see, uh, once in this movie you see a one of the zombies kill people. You hear about it. Mm. Yeah, but secondhand reporting. Yeah, Even all the deaths up. in this film are the deaths of people turning because they're infected. Or uh, not deaths, by the way, but like the loss of the character. Yeah. So... I think that was far more effective than seeing, in a sense, like just someone that. you care about torn apart. Seeing the slow succumbing of people, and and because it has the like the weird, it, it showed that you're infected by repetition, so you can see characters start to the turn things. And yeah, and well, I don't know if it's infection by repetition. I I think that well, what it was it. supposed to be said, simple, or what they were saying. Yeah was that repetition was your body trying to fight it mm-hmm. because you're trying to make the word lose meaning by repeating, they did but it didn't work. Too, but so, which I thought was a brilliant thing to throw in as well. well. Like mm-hmm. you, Once you're repeating something, you're already infected. But it's 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 almost like showing the bite in a uh, traditional yeah, zombie, zombie film. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But that's the thing. Is, it's one where you, the zombies don't kill anyone, like or at least Not none on of screen. the characters yeah. that you're following. It's about the slow turn. 
and I was incredibly yeah. Well, that's it's sort of not, it's sort mm-hmm. of going to be like I would say naturally more psychologically more affecting, mm-hmm. and it's it's rare to see that be done anymore, especially in a zombie ish type of movie. It's more just like them eating you. But you're right; they they subverted it very cleverly. I thought in that sense. And also, there's a thing that uh, the important part of horror is to tell but not to show yeah. that when you show the monster it loses effectiveness yeah. right so they have a the uh their eye in the sky guy on the cell phone you you're, you don't you never meet this character you just hear yeah. his voice it's on just, the yep, radio exactly and he's developed very well throughout that you i, I actually like the guy uh <laughs> and wished him well even though it turns out he was a pedophile but well, he wasn't a pedophile you just don't bring he, your kids he around may, him. he may or may not have been <laughs> one but. but again that's about that goes into another theme on here about the illusions of small towns mm. You sl- you hear him slowly succumb to the virus on the phone and broadcast to the, the whole world, and it is an effective and tragic death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, agree. And the uh, Afghan intern, what was her name? I believe I missed Laurel. I felt like I, I, she had been developed very well. Like she yeah. very she's well characterized. To see her and know that she's beyond the point of again, like this was perhaps one of the most effective zombie films in a in a world that has been beset upon by zombie films. Yeah, yeah. sure. Well, this is, it was definitely a good that. way to go. It was definitely a, a, a good take on it, very different than anything else I've ever seen. Mm. So we can say and it, and it gets me because, you know, it's all about words and I love that shit. Yeah, like so. I said, like yeah, it's we sort of have, <coughs> have an affinity for that and uh, it, they touch upon it all very well. So regardless of how many themes there are, all of them are addressed well, I think, in this film and I'm definitely giving it a one. Yeah, yeah, I'm giving it a one as well. I'm going with a one too. See the the antagonist. The antagonist. Well, Scott mentioned earlier, and I guess it's kind of true. Is well, actually, let me let me say this. I guess the antagonist is the English language the English itself. Language, yes, of course. <laughs> you know, every like in all zombie films, there's not like really a physical thing to be angry at. It's whatever is turning people into zombies, pretty much. Well, that's not necessarily true because oftentimes, especially now. It goes to like some evil corporation or That's true. umbrella of um, yeah. or, or any of their. Ex- but you're right in right. this case. But it's not. That. But it's like it's especially well. I guess if they're if the, if the cause is unexplained in a zombie film, you, it's not like you can get mad at the zombies for becoming zombies. I do. They should have had uh, <laughs> stronger wills. That's true. But I don't know how you can see language as an antagonist either. Because it doesn't actually well the corruption of language. I the, would say the the virus say. I guess mm-hmm. that infected language is the antagonist in this case, which is awesome, a great idea, but it's nothing that... There's nothing to, like, be... I understand what you're saying. ...antagonized by in this film, which is fine, but I don't know if there is an actual, like, strong antagonist. I don't I don't think it needs one, per se. Yeah, I understand exactly what you're <clears throat> saying, but I think that's why it's effective. Like, language going viral, like, literally, I think is a good one. Yeah, it's clever. You're right, there's no, like, physical thing to be angry at, but I think it's a great... Um, antagonists because again I have an affinity for it it's something I like to explore like if language itself can be used against ourselves as such how the hell do you fight that and they explore that in this film as well a little bit but all I'm saying I think it is a effectual antagonist even if it doesn't physically exist in well, a sense it's, it's definitely an effective I like the idea conceit, of it, I guess yes. but like is it an actual antagonist I will, I'm going to agree with Steve on this if I could take some of the points that is deserving of themes uh, put it in the antagonist mm. spot. <laughs> yeah. It would get a one because like themes deserve a ten on their own. But this thing is like, it's a thematic antagonist, mm-hmm. and right. it's a survival type movie. And I don't think there's really anyone to point the conflict at. And is that a failing of the movie? No, but it's still not there. There's not even a secondary. Like generally in a survival thing, you have a secondary character who. Is like, like, causing trouble. A badass within the group or whatever. Well, yeah. No, but like, the, or the weasel yeah, who exactly. like screws up others. Every single character in this film is heroic to and, a and certain extent. To a certain extent well. Even the weasley doctor ends up when he realizes that he is like he's infected. Into it, he yeah. decides to do a heroic sacrifice. So I don't think that this has any like. No one in this movie did anything wrong. It's just them facing a situation and. It's not to a detriment of an overall of the overall movie, but there is nothing. There's no antagonist there. Right. Mm, I mean, again, you, all, you both make perfectly valid points. It's just that I think I'm going to give it a one, even though even though it's not traditional and yes, it doesn't exist in the same sense that other horror ones would exist. Uh, I have to give it a zero because uh, uh, the lack thereof of an antagonist. Right. I don't. I don't see like it I said, as. I, I don't see it, it as being an antagonist. That's so, fair. Scott, I just, you're giving it a one. Yeah. yeah. Just for me. Zero. 
Yep, zero okay. for me. For me, it's enough to do it. So okay. I'm uh, moving to protagonists. I'm gonna say there are two. You have uh, Sydney, and more so than her is uh, Grant Massey. And I love the character of Grant Massey because he's sort of a he's not a heroic person. He's a dark ass with a heart of gold. Yeah, he is that, but he's he has a bravado behind uh, when he has a microphone in front of him. Hmm. But he is almost not cowardly, but self-serving hmm. when confronted with danger. And I, I actually think he is develop like develops that by the end of the movie but there's a great part where he and Sydney are trying like well a, g- a little girl attacks uh, Sydney at a point and he r- rushes to her aid because that's in the moment of like a hot blooded choice mm-hmm. and they end up killing a little girl but when the doctor's infected they're discussing whether who's going to go down and kill the doctor and he's like you killed the little girl so uh, you're going to go down and kill the doctor too and Sydney's arguing that he killed the little girl he's like alright uh, yeah fine I killed the little girl then you have to go kill someone now so you don't kill the doctor. Again, he's not willing to put himself into... He's not willing to rise to that level of a hero until the very sure. end. His, his heroism is within the scope of his character. It's not about him charging yeah. out and killing That's a bunch well of things. He goes to broadcast the cure on the radio. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and putting himself in danger. So it's almost like a perfect character. He's philosophical throughout it. And that really appeals to me because I like my philosophy. Talk about Sydney for a moment. She has a thread, too. She starts off as kind of the prudish... The straight man. Yeah, the straight man. Then she goes through her, like, part where we're going to die, and then she rises to that heroic era to be Grant's equal in this. Hmm. Although she gets saved, at no point is she the damsel in distress, really. Yes, that's very much true. So I think they did a very good job, and both actors did a phenomenal job in portraying their characters, and yeah, they're great. I agree. Um, I, I really love Grant. He was an, a, a very well drawn protagonist and characterized. And I, maybe this guy even had experience doing radio. He had a great. He did have a great radio voice for sure. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the lines, you know, the, the script itself gave him like quite good lines and speeches and his radio rants. When she, and especially when he realizes what's happening, he tries to fight it. And yeah, all his choices, all his motivations, all make sense. And same same is true as of Sydney as well. So yeah, they were they were a very strong protagonists. I think they did a, both did a great job with the script and the acting as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there, there's not too much more to say in that. Uh, I, I would say that uh, the guy who played Grant Mazzy, maybe this is more, maybe this is a little bit stylistic, but uh, I thought he had incredible facial expressions. They had a lot of great mm. shots from behind the boom mic that yep. he has in the studio. You're right, it was a nice touch for sure. But yeah, he, he really filled out that part really well. And uh, Sydney did a great job. Who are the, the woman who played Sydney did a really good job as well. Just two really strong characters. And I guess she's probably going to be. A supporting character, but like almost treading that line was uh, Laurel, the mm. their intern, who was actually the second one introduced in the movie before Sydney came in. And yeah, that's true. She had a lot of really good parts up until she got infected, mm. and then I think her part when she got infected was also good. Oh well, yeah, she, she was did. no longer she a character at that there, point, yeah. but still, yeah, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, anybody else? One's all around. Yeah, I think all know. around. I think, think one. Right? Yeah. All right, Scott, supporting characters. All right, well, Doc Mendez, of course, or Menendez, I believe. Mm-hmm. I'm giving him a one in our grand edition of... Wait, are Senator Bob Menendez? <laughs> <laughs> Senator Bob Menendez no. showed um, up in this movie. It's going to get a good score because he was a great side character. And like like you touched on it before, was he necessary? Yes, but did that fall into a cliche trope? Yes, but they still did it well, I think. Mm. He had, somebody had to explain some little thing, and I did like the fact he didn't explain it all. He's like, he's figuring out, actually, almost literally on air with them, and they, you know, they're figuring out how to fight this thing together. He figures out what it is, and he's trying to you know, trying to explain it that to them. And they're like, what? "But it's also like all the characters have a lack of clarity when they're like in the moment." Yes. So, Which like, goes to it, the it's not like he ever gave a speech where he is saying, "Oh, this is happening." It's like, "Oh, this could be." I, I don't know. Like, yeah. and, it, and it's you can really see the inner workings of his mind as it's going. Yes, agreed. And perhaps if all these characters had used language more effectively, <laughs> they would have survived it's possible either way it, i think he did a good job and laurel also was an excellent supporting character as well i, I enjoyed her when she was an actual character mm-hmm. and you know she played sort of the the initial like her transformation finally convinced them and it was it was ter- it was menacing as well she was charging at the sound booth because i think they said like the, the the infected can sense signals or something like that which i thought was a nice touch or they were trying to debate whether they can read lips yes because yeah. they were drawn to like language, language. yeah exactly so she was you know smashing herself to bloody bits against the glass which was something that was described earlier by Ken who also was a real dumb side character even though he, he was just a disembodied voice from a cell phone in the, in the uh, throughout the whole movie uh, well they did a great subversion in this because they keep reinforcing that she had been in Afghanistan 
So in a lesser movie, they would have had her rise up to like use her military training mm. to like, save the day, like shoot her way but out, almost, basically. Was, uh, yeah, and especially they had a guy with like I guess a fake machine gun in earlier. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, was, uh, <laughs> no, it was more of a joke bit yeah. thing before. Well, they, they did a Lawrence of the Ara- uh, Arabia, Lawrence and the Arabians yeah, as Arab- like a local musical. I guess they were putting yes. on. Yeah. So uh, again, like that, they could have gone that route, but they didn't. And no matter uh, all of her training, all of her expertise, she got infected. Wouldn't yeah, help was, her at all. The yeah. the one time that she, that she actually used any of her training was just to say, "We got an enemy, sir," and shut the door and like get everybody back inside. Well, that was basically think, it. If you guys noticed, they had, had a very nice line uh, from her that something like when it was happening, they mentioned about it, and she goes like, "Was it the point where she was like?" She's like, "I bring something." I, yeah, she's like, "Only the experience is back in my head." Yeah, something what like does that. Mean I don't know. Yeah, like that. Well, was that's very right nice when she. Touch. That's right yeah. when she's infected. Exactly, and it, it's about yeah, when she says that to turn, and then she starts turning like immediately after that. Says um, we're missing, uh, missing, Mazzy. missing, missing, Mazzy. Mazzy is yeah. her like key phrase to start. No, he's in the he's in the booth. No, no, we're missing, we're missing, Mazzy. missing like, yeah. They do tension very well in here, and they give yes. the subtle little clues that something's wrong. Like perfectly exactly. Well. So yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about Ken. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because I think he goddamn deserves it. <laughs> Fair enough. He's a friggin' hero. Hero in the field. But uh, the, the one of the best parts is when he's like talking about going to try and get an interview with the kid who's like has his hands chopped off and is bashed through the barn, like completely broken all his bones in his <laughs> yeah. body, and like he's just whispering something like crazy. And Ken's like, I'm gonna go try and talk to him. And uh, Grant's like, I don't know if that's a good idea. I wouldn't Ken. do that. Uh, I wouldn't Ken, do that very... don't, don't go near the kid. Yeah, yeah. And he kind of walks up to him. And then he's. It cuts out. That's when it cuts out. It cuts out. There's this weird broadcast that at the end says not to translate it. Well, well, we talked about that earlier. And it comes back. The kid is like, "Do you guys get that? And then he plays this weird baby talk coming from the kid. And it says, it sounds like there's a small child on his breath or <laughs> yeah. something like that. And he, Ken just had like some of the best lines. Like when he says like, look in their eyes. They look like dogs. They, they have eyes like dogs eyes or something like that. And, like they're just tearing each other apart. And he, com- he compares the mob to... When he describes them as piranhas, mm, yeah, that whole part, like he has some really good descriptive parts, even though he's like cowering in fear in the silo or whatever. But uh, I love that character. Laurel was really good, at, as you said, and, and the Doctor was awesome. Actually, the Doctor I thought was maybe the weakest on-screen character. Yeah. However, he did serve his purpose for sure, and I liked certain parts of his. I like his quirks. Exactly. Yeah, again, he was well characterized for the time he's on screen, but. Um, I just want to mention the thing about Ken that everything you said is true and I agree with it it was great they also did a kind of a double subversion in a horror thing where you think the first time he, he's like oh they're, they're, you think he's dead? they're rushing their ride here you think he's going to get cut off there and like well then and he keeps coming back and of course he eventually <laughs> yeah. does have the honor of death but it like, takes him like five calls no he doesn't have do the honor of death he has the honor of turn yes right yeah. he turns on there and they're like you know it was a bit, it's, again it's very um, impactful he's like well goodbye Ken like, we'll miss you like, so all that yeah, definitely one from me <laughs> so or most of you Yes. In dialogue. You were just mentioning this. I was just mentioning this. I think that the dialogue is done really well, although a lot of it is monologue in this film. It's a lot of people just saying, either Ken, like, saying what he's seeing, or even even in the conversation, the only conversations that really, that seem like true dialogue are uh, Grant and Sidney. Like, even every time the doctor's on screen, it seems like he's kind of just talking to himself. And, like... Well, he's speaking at the audience, kind of, too. Or just rambling to himself. I, I it, it just kind of seems like he's in his own world like transfixed by all the things that are going on he's like studying it in this really like scientific way he was like oh i haven't seen them do this before yeah well, or that, whatever that was and, a really like, good characterization i think so he goes into this radio studio grant and sydney are really trying to figure out what the hell is going on and he gives no like immediate explanation like you would expect from him mm-hmm. this is the one thing that i like i really noticed because as soon as he came in, I was expecting to get like this grand dialogue about like mm-hmm. what was going on and like them asking questions and him answering them but he doesn't really directly answer any of their questions. Yeah. And they don't really ask him that many questions. But uh, I, I, I thought it was really interesting the way that they did that part. And and the dialogue between Grant and Sidney was pretty solid all the way through. I loved Grant's like rants on, on the air. Grant's rants. Grant's rants. Yeah, that's a good segment. <laughs> yeah, it's a new segment. I, I want to make a point that we have been quoting this movie throughout this podcast. And... I don't think we've reviewed many movies where we've been such, yeah. actively doing that. Yeah. To highlight, and not only that, to highlight characterization, we've been quoting characters. So that's a sign of a very effective dialogue. And there's one moment I'd like to explain. I mentioned this earlier that the BBC comes in trying to get them. And the conversation that 
uh, Grant has with Nigel, the Nigel BBC Tim. host. Yeah, Grant is you can from his, just his facial expressions, you can tell that he understands that he's out of his league. Like, oh shit, I'm on the BBC, yeah. <laughs> and his failure. Um, again, this idea of commu- like dialogue here and um, and language and our failure to communicate and our then mm. the evolution of language is persistent throughout this and. All the characters, when they need to, when they need to be at their clearest, give the expositional speech. They fail to do that. Grant fails to at the mm. very end. He gives an awesome speech, but it's a rambling, almost incoherent speech. The doctor, who is supposed to give the expositional dialogue, does not. And Nigel, who is supposed to be the voice of reason, is shown new, to new be to as, best and, uh, as and uninformed at worst. Yeah. The dialogue is really wrapped up with the themes that they're trying to make in this and I have to give that a complete complete uh, I just want to props for that I just want to break in for just a really short thing I love after the interview with the BBC when he's like oh that was our affiliate. that was our affiliate station yeah. the BBC You're right like as you said reporting like that was such a nice little natural little, like almost like dig it's perfectly fitting for what's happening but we were all like enjoyed that and amused by it and, yeah. and the, the movie is full of things like that so I, I'm just going to say that broadly like yeah Given the themes and what it contains, what it's about, I would think the dialogue has to be strong, and it totally was. Mm. So, so I'm giving it a one. I'm going to go ahead and give it a one. I will agree. So style. As mentioned earlier, this is I, I felt that this was David Lynchian for at least the first half. For parts of it, yeah. bits of it. It was. Although, I don't know if it was completely David Lynchian in terms of like a visual style, mm. because it was mm. a lot more spare than David Lynch yeah, right. usually is. Well, no, but that's, I feel it was a, a restrained version. They they do the surreal very well in here. They do strange shots, like the close-up of the little uh, mo- the the drum monkey, monkey yeah. that, that he uses for a prop on the radio to like make the drum noise. Him searching around his desk for things, like especially when he's paranoid around, yeah. that people are like making a mockery of him by like as this is it's a an hoax. elaborate hoax, yes. Or if you think that he's infected, when people get really infected, there's great stylistic elements of them where they're kind of spacing out, talking to themselves. This thing is this entire movie happens in a radio station, and I both felt the claustrophobic angle of that, and I mentioned earlier Definitely. also that the isolation of it. Mm-hmm. But I never wished them to leave the radio station. I was intrigued by the atmosphere of this entire place and the, the way they explored different segments of this building. I was really impressed. I definitely agree with that. And also, like, I just want to mention there's a detail. Yes, they're in a radio station, but it's also in a church. And, and so, like, yeah. so he says... It's he's a church, like, not a dungeon. Another another piece of dialogue. It's the basement of the church. Ma- yeah. Mazzy says, we're in the dungeon. She goes, it's a church on the dungeon. But sort of, again, if you want to take it as such, it comments that subversion of, like, the old fighting, you know, holding up in a church and fighting the zombie horde. Mm. Like, you know, it's sort of, like, inserted mm. in there, but not really, like, highlighted. It's just kind of there. But I thought it was, well, again, a well-dropped-in detail that they didn't have to uh, dwell on, but it was there if, if you noticed it. I love the visual a style of this film. Uh, I thought they did a really good job cinematically. I agree with that as well. The thing that was oddly absent for me was a good soundtrack. I don't remember any of the music, if there was any. Mm-hmm. And it's strange because it's a movie, I mean, it's well, because it's a film about a radio station. Yeah, well, it's so, about talk radio and about language, yeah. so. so. Right. You know what I mean? So that's why the... But I, I they think certainly that's, have... Um, it's purpose, like, at this absent. radio station, they have music, mm-hmm. well, they, things but, like that. To counter that, if you think of music, this is more of a spoken word album. And it definitely has those elements. Like a lot of Grant's rants have like a beat poet quality. Yes, I agree with that. I was going to say that earlier. They absolutely do. But significantly absent, I would say, is like a good soundtrack. I don't remember. Maybe, but I don't remember if if there was a score to this. I don't remember a score happening. I don't think there was. But the thing is, like, I didn't notice it at the time until you pointed it out right now. I think it's perfectly fine. Another thing, sir, like when, when they record the message, Sydney Breyer, I think is her last name. So they decide to, in order to um, you know, communicate with the outside world, they loop Mazzy saying. No, no it's to distract the right. uh, zombies outside. Right, right. So, so. right. In order to lure the herd out, he ha- he loops a, a single phrase, and but it's also like a, an SOS, like a cry for help, because mm-hmm. it's saying Sydney Breyer's alive, like repeated over and over and over. That became its own soundtrack because as they moved through the station, it was constantly repeated. That actually is the closest thing to a soundtrack that I can think there's of. There's one other thing oh. too. They did. They were playing Muzak on air. Like they mentioned it. Like I. Even right, Sydney says, was, like, we can't have music background. playing during the apocalypse. But yes, I understand, but I'm just saying. Not, it's a one little element that we kind of a footnote to our podcast. But the use of that, the zombies start repeating 
so like in different inflections. Yeah. And then at the very end of the movie, they have the the military like they contact uh, her. And Sydney say, Breyer, are you alive? Like, which yeah. is repeating again the. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, like I, that scene. I love that, and I'm not saying I, this isn't going to get a zero on style yeah. for me because of the lack of. You just it, noticed the lack. Of it's soundtrack. something that mm. I that I noticed that. Fair was strange in a movie about a radio station to well, me. We didn't watch the end credits, so it was interesting to see what the music over the end credits would have been. I don't think there was any but, either, uh, but I want to mention one other detail statistically that also links back to Ken and some other things. When people would call in, they would cut to a couple of shots of like the signal, like what their voice is translating to, right. like the waves. But a very nice touch to like you know, sort of sort of gives them characterization, like oh, here's Ken's wave or whatever. Mm-hmm. So like that was a nice little yeah. style, style touch as well. So definitely getting a one from me. All right, I'm giving it a one as well. And I'm also going to give it a one right. just for the cinematic style. And I'm giving it a one for the auditory style. And not the, not just the soundtrack, but like the way that people speak throughout it. And There the, certainly is a rhythm. And, and the repetition that's throughout this. There's there's a great rhythm to yes. this movie, even if there's no music to it. I absolutely agree with that. Um, as well said. So, Scott, uh, I'm sure you're going to recommend this. I definitely am. And I just want to add that, yeah, th- this was a very surprising sort of sleeper hit that like we... We're going to give it a good score, it looks like. And it was very well done. It's sort of an unknown thing. Yeah, it's, in quote, a foreign film, but it's in English. It's just Canadian. It was great. It was written very well, acted very well, contained a number of great themes that we all liked and had some also great commentary within those themes that perhaps handled poorly. They, sort of, they would have got jumbled or wouldn't have come off as well. But this one, I think, sustained itself throughout the whole time and definitely was worth a watch. Yeah, it was... A great movie. It, it, it kind of put me in the mindset of like just kind of like an offbeat type of movie that I don't know. I, I'm trying to. I've been trying to think of like another work that this kind of reminds me of. The whole time, the only thing I, I came up with is like Welcome to Night Vale podcast. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's just this really strange story that is pulled off in very, a very smart, terrific movie. way. Yeah, if if you are into the idea that language is important and powerful, it's a great thing. It's a great film to watch. If you're into just psychologically gripping horror movies it's a great movie to watch so definitely check it out this movie balances a fine line because there's one thing i can't stand it's obscurely thematic movies that are exploring so much that they explore nothing Mm. and this movie teeters on that explores a lot but not over explores it but when i watched it i was never upset by that it added it was trying to tackle too much i felt that Whoever, whether it was the screenwriter, whether it was the director, whoever had the idea for the film and how to proceed with this knew how to balance all mm-hmm. the elements correctly. They gave enough to satisfy, but left enough for discussion. Absolutely agree. This is one of the most intelligent horror movies I've seen in a very long time. If you're looking for a good, gory horror movie, this is not what you're going to watch. But if you're looking for something to like sit down and analyze... A smart but entertaining, in quotes, horror film. Uh, like, this is kind of, if you're ch- looking to shut off your brain, you're not going to like this movie. But if you're, like, again, if you're one engaged. of us, yeah. if you're listening to this podcast, one of us. you'll probably very much like it. So I, I give it a full endorsement. So we've come to the end. I'll read off the scores. Scott, you gave it a perfect 10. And Steve and I gave it both a 9. Mm-hmm. Giving us a 9.3333, repeating, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. three. 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 Repeat. Three. Three is five. Three is five. Five equals eight. Three is T. So we have one more Halloween movie to come after this, which is going to be the teens. So we'll see you back tomorrow. Lost signals, signals, lost signals, lost, lost signals. Goodbye. Party pool. Party pool. This Saturday, we'll be doing a live review of Halloween the movie at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on our YouTube channel. So please come join us. This has been Bon Mott. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Music by Chris Morgan. Editing and engineering by Scott Thurlow. This has been a Lost Signals production. All rights reserved. <laughs>